Repeat after me. Say, Father, we thank you for the power of your word. Father, we ask that you'll anoint your word as a seed into my life. Father, we ask that you'll anoint the sword. Hide them in a gift that comes from you. And I do believe that I will receive a life-changing, destiny-accelerating revelation of you through your word, by your spirit, under your anointing. In Jesus' name I pray. Expecting and expecting. Amen and amen. Well, let me ask you, who knows what week we're on for Word 52? 22. Amen. We're halfway through, and um, it's amazing what God is going to do. So let me jump right in. If you, um, for this week, we're going to look at um, a few things, but let me start off by um, describing what we're going to talk about. Jeremiah 11 and 12. And, and when, you, when you read that, you're going to find out that it's about the broken covenant and the questions that followed that Jeremiah had and some other things. Second Kings 22 and 23 is about King Josiah, the youngest king ever. Can you imagine being a king at eight? Wow. I'm sure he was surrounded by some people, but uh, wow, at eight. And uh, his death and the reign of his son, um, Jehoaz and Jehoiakim, but who, but who did evil in the sight of the Lord. Second Chronicles 35 and 36, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 35 and 36, it's about King jo jo Josiah keeping the Passover and once again his death in the reign of his two sons. Jeremiah 13 and 47 is about the judgments, prophecies, and consequences of not staying in faithful relationship with the one and only true God and the mercy and, and restoration that was available. It's, it's a powerful chapter. It's a powerful book. Uh, Daniels 1 and 2 is about God's power and faithfulness on display through Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And, and it's, it's really about how God is able to do what he says that he's able to do. Amen? And then when we look at 2 Kings 24, it's about Jehoiakim's Jeho uh, rebellion against King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and his sons once again um, ruling, ruling in Judah and Jerusalem and then about them being captured and, and brought into captivity. So we're going to look at some things and we're going to talk about specifically how it, how it uh, impacts us today. The title of my message today is, What's Happening? You need to let that settle in for a second. And I'm not talking about the TV show back in the 70s, What's Happening? Nor am I talking about when you greet someone you haven't seen in a minute. Hey, what's happening? No, I'm not talking about that what's happening. The what's happening that I'm talking about is that uh, when judgment, calamities that, that come via the sword, pestilence, and famines, and, and famines that make you say, what's happening? When you look around and you see all of this stuff happening, what's happening? Because for some reason, you, you, you're at a place and you're saying, my God. And we're going to look at that. Now, repeat this. Say, the people, the promise, the practice, the promotion. One more time. The people, the promise, the practice, the promotion. Okay, well, let's look at the people. The chosen. 
the children of Israel. These are the people. And we're going to look at some very interesting things. Judgment wasn't instant or immediate on the children of Israel for their wrongdoings, wrong living, and wrong ways, which caused them to be on the wrong side of God. But his mercy and forgiveness was waiting for them when they repented and turned back to God due to the love that he had for his chosen people. That's, that's, that's an amazing place. That's, that's, that's an amazing place to be that when you're called to be the chosen people of God. Whew. Now, there's a lot of titles that you can have on your name, but when you're called to be the chosen, there's nothing that can top that. They needed to, the, the children of Israel needed to realize that this was a covenant that, that they were in with, with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and not some blind date or one night stand. They had to really get that in their mind and understand that this was a covenant. This wasn't something that's fly by night. So this is something that we're going to look at and, and, and get a deeper understanding of it. You know, just as they expected God to keep and honor his word, God expected them to keep and honor their word in this covenant. And so we're going to look at some things. Question or let me say questions. How did the children of Israel go from being chosen and blessed to being castaways and judged? How do you go from being chosen and blessed to being castaways and then judged? Wow, you started off as chosen. How do you get there? We're gonna find out. Next question. How did they go from being the head and above only to being beneath and the tail? In other words, they were the butt of the jokes at the dinner table at night. When you spoke, when you talked, you, you brought their names up because you understood where they were. They were no longer walking in that chosen place. But now they were castaways. They were judged and the people were seeing this and they were saying and they were saying, wait a minute. What about the God that you claim you serve the true and living God? You surely don't look like the chosen people. OK. All right. That's cool. The answer. Because the true and living God, his ways were, ne were never appealing to the natural man the true and living God. His ways were never or is never appealing to the natural man. But the false gods and their beliefs are always appealing to the natural man. So in other words, there were things that God wanted them to do as a chosen people that they simply didn't like. So instead, the false gods and their beliefs were more appealing to them than what they thought the true and living God um, desires and, and, and wants and needs that he had for them. That's an amazing, I mean, that's just, you have to really let that register because we're looking, now, you, I mean, you, you got to remember, the chosen, whew. I mean, you can put that in all caps, highlight that, put that in bold because that's an amazing title to have on you. So the chosen people decided to choose the wrong things and when it didn't work, come running back to God for forgiveness and for help. I wonder how many times I have done something <laughs> because I thought I knew more than God. And when it didn't work, I came running back for forgiveness and for help. I wonder. Okay. So, when we look at the fact that they were the chosen people, how they initially started off, and then how they ended up being in captivity, how they were um, plagued with famines, how people will come in and raid their town and their land, how do you go from the chosen 
to now you're in captivity. Whew. That's an amazing place to be, and we're going to look at something. Someone say the promise. It's God's lifetime guarantee now and then without any expiration dates on it. This is, this is God's promise. It's a lifetime guarantee with no expiration date. When you look at Jeremiah 11 and 2, it says this. It says, hear the words of this covenant. Now, you have to slow down right here because God says, wait a minute. You need to, you need, you need to, you need to stop. You need to settle, your, settle yourself because you need to hear the words of this covenant because it's lifetime. And then he goes on and he says that, and speak to the, to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Yeah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So God says that he wants you to really understand and get a under, he wanted them to understand exactly what it was that they were stepping into when he says, hear the words of this covenant. Because this is just not some fly-by-night contract. This is a covenant, and I like that. And then Jeremiah 11 and 5, it says this, that I may establish the oath, the oath, which I have sworn to your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is this day. And I answered and said, so be it, Lord. This is Jeremiah talking. God breaks it down as to what type of covenant is going to be. And he says, it's going to be a land that's flowing with milk and honey. In other words, let's look at a land, a place that they can call their own. God says, I'm going to give you that. That's going to be your land. This is something you can say, God gave this to me, gave this to us because we are his chosen people. That's the land. Flowing, in other words, full of life, full of opportunities. That means that when you step on this land, this is just not some barren land. This is not just some land that's been neglected. No, God says it's going to be flowing. It's going to have life and it's going to have opportunities. You're going to be able to do things that other nations can't do. You're going to stand out. That's why I say you will be like a light that shines in darkness. God says, this is the type of land that I'm going to give you. It's going to be flowing. But hold up. He don't stop there. He says, now you got the land. Now you're flowing. He says, now I'm going to give you the milk. All the essential things that you could ever need. There won't be any lack. God says, when you step on this land full of life and opportunities, he says, then I'm going to give you every essential thing that you will ever need. He says, you will be the lender and not the borrower. borrower. And so understanding that God says, I'm setting this up so no nation could ever say, I am greater than your God. Whoo, this is the milk. Hold up, we, we, we haven't gotten to the last part. We're talking about the honey now. Oh my God. All the good things that you could ever want. Whoo, right here on planet Earth. I got the land. It's flowing, it's got milk, and it's laced with honey. Whew. So you mean tell me you will give me the desires of my heart as long as they're in line with your perfect will? I don't know about you. I would love to be the chosen people. Wow. I, I, I just got to let that resonate for a second. The next thing. Someone say the practice. the practice. Let's see. We talked about the people. We talked about the promise. Now let's talk about the practice. And, I'm, and it wasn't there a TV show called The Practice? I'm not talking about that practice, okay? Doing it over and over and over and over without stopping because you understand the blessings and benefits that's associated with this practice. Second King 22 and 1 says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. 
And let me drop to verse 22. And, he, and it says this, and he says, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. That's, that's the practice right there. In other words, when, when, when jo King Josiah, when he stepped into that covenant, he says, wait a minute. In order to get the promise, he says, there's some things that I'm going to have to practice. Some things that I'm going to have to do in order to receive everything that God has for me. Oh, I like that. In other words, he could not practice evil and wickedness. He couldn't walk in that. That was not a lane that he could walk in because he understood that, wait a minute, I'm trying to get to the promised land or I'm trying to be that chosen people for, for God. You could not practice that, nor worship false gods and fa false idols. I couldn't do that. He couldn't do that because in, it, when you think about the true and living God, and I like this, compared to the false gods, when you, when you run their resume, there, be, there should be something that, that, that separates the true and living God from the false God. There has got to be something for me to see and say, wait a minute, even though you tell me what your God can do, even though you tell me how many gods you serve, but there's none like the one that I serve. And this is what King, Jos uh, King Josiah was about. He says, look, I understand the God that I serve, and I'm not looking to the right, and I'm not looking to the left. You can't tell me anything different about my God. Whew. You just, I mean, you really got to, you got to really uh, catch this question. This is the question from Jeremiah. I like this. This is him responding to the Lord. He says, righteous are you, O Lord, when I, when I, when I plead with you, yet let me talk with you about your judgment. So this is Jeremiah saying, okay, I see what's happening. I see what's going on. He says, let me ask you a few questions. And I like this. And he, and he asks, he says, why does the wicked prosper? Hold on, hold on. First of all, we're the chosen people. All of a sudden, we have pestilence, we have famines, we have wars, but I look to the left and I look to the right and the wicked people are prospering. Why wouldn't I want to go serve their God? Because they're, they're experiencing something we should be experiencing as the chosen people. What's happening? That's the question you got to ask. And then he goes on, he says, why are the, he says, why are those happy who deal so treacherously? In other words, why do people feel good when they deal treacherously with other people? Why do they feel good about that? They're smiling, they're laughing, they're, they're having parties, they're having cookouts, and, and they're doing all kinds of things. Why are they so happy about that? Now, you got to understand this. We're being judged. We're in captivity. And man, does that not look tempting? Makes me want to go over and check it out. Because right now, my God is not living up to his promise. At least that's what I think. But we're going to look at some things. Amen. When the true and living God says it is forbidden and off limits. But watch this. But the foreign and false gods says it's completely uh, uh, available and without limits. Who and what do you choose? Man, that's a tough place to be. Wow. They're looking and you're seeing them prosper. They're wicked. They're evil. And they're saying that our God is this. Our God is that. The many of them combined can do this and do that. Your God is doing absolutely nothing. Who and what do I choose? That's a tough place to be. And the answer to it is um, in Jeremiah uh, 11 and 3. And this is Jeremiah saying, and say to them, or the Lord speaking to Jeremiah, he says, and say to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, cursed is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant. Hold on. I just put the question out in the air. What's happening? 
And then God says, let me explain to you what's happening. He says, and, and, I, and I like that. He says, he says, curse is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant. Whew. Mm, mm, mm. And then he goes on in verse four, which I commanded your fathers in the day. And I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron, iron furnace saying, obey my voice and do according to all that I have commanded you. So shall my people and I will, you shall be my people and I will be your God. So God, he was telling the children of Israel in order to be my chosen people, you have to walk in this covenant that I have established. In other words, you can't be moved by what the false advertisement is over here to your left and the false advertisement that's over here to your right. He says, you stick to the true, the one and true living God. He says, regardless on what it looks like, never get to a place that you forget that you're in covenant with me. Whew. See, now we understand how they went from the chosen to the captive to the judged. Whew. My God. You know, that's, uh, that's one of those things that, uh, that as, as, as we look at the children of Israel and as we look at how, then there's so much more in, in that, but the key thing is, is that when we step in that covenant, when they stepped into that covenant, it was more to it than they could imagine. The land flowing with milk and honey. It doesn't matter what the what statistics, surveys, and studies say. It doesn't matter what I feels and I thinks are about because God says, this is what I told you. Whew. Oh my God. That's, 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 that's an amazing thing. Now, you know, when we, when we look at, what was that? Well, we talked about the practice. Now let's look at the promotion. The promotion. Because I understand the people, I understand the promise, now let's look at the promotion. And when we look at the promotion, it's elevation because of obedience. Elevation because of, obedient, of o obedience. This is how you get the promotion. I understand you can, you can create an impressive resume, but the greatest way to get promoted in God's kingdom is through obedience. He's not impressed with your resume, but he is impressed with your obedience. Amen? Okay, in Daniel 1 and 8, it says this. It says, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food. Oh, let's just stop right there. Daniel already decided from the inside that I'm not going to defile myself with the king's food. It wasn't that the food was bad or it wasn't um, from planet Earth. What he said was it wasn't, it wasn't prepared in a way that my God wants it prepared. It wasn't done in the way that my God wants it done. It was done to represent and to give honor to your false gods and your false beliefs. But I like this. And then he goes on and he says, or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. So Daniel was, he was set. He understood. He says, now that I'm in the practice, he says, he says, now I'm ready for the promotion. And he says, and the way that I'm going to get that promotion is through my obedience. Oh, my God. We're going to see something here in a minute. In Daniels 1 and 20, it says, and, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians, the astrologers who were, who, who were in all his realm. In other words... God says, he says, because of your obedient, obedience, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and Daniel, he says they were 10 times better. Oh, my God. God says, he says, not only 
will you get to inherit the land that's flowing with milk and honey? He says, but in the process, when you compare my people against the world's people, they're going to be 10 times better. I don't have to brag about it. I don't have to shout about it in terms of to try to impress them. God says, I'm going to do it all for you. This is where Daniel was. You got to understand, he was at a place where his life could have been on the line. But instead, he chose to walk in obedience. In other words, he says, look, God, God's got this. I'm just going to obey. Ten times, not one, not two times, not four times, ten times better. Wow. And then Daniel 2 and 28 says this. It says, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions your head, uh, the visions of your head upon your bed were these. In other words, Daniel, he took on a task that everybody else was afraid of because the king made a decree. If you can't properly tell me what I was dreaming about, he says, you're going to be put to death. I'm going to show you just how amazing your God is. Because if your God can give you the interpretation of what I'm dreaming, he says, then you're the man. Are, are you guys with me? He says, you're the man. All the, the astrologers, all the other people was like, oh, no, oh, that's, that, that, that's too high of a cost. We can't do that. Our God doesn't go that high. He doesn't tell us that much. But Daniel says, I got this because my God got this. Whew, this is amazing. And then it's, it, you, you drop down to verse um, 48. This is where I want to go. It says, then the king promoted Daniel. Hold on, hold on, hold on. The king promoted Daniel. He promoted Daniel because he was obedient to his God. And because God was, was, was uh, magnified in what Daniel did, God says, let me step in and do the rest. I like the fact that God made him 10 times better. So it's undeniable. You can't tell me it was because of a, home, a, 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 a chromosome or you can't tell me it's because of this or that. Only God could have done that. This was the only God promotion because man can't get credit for this. Are you with me on that? It says he promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts. Wait a minute. You promote me and then you give me great gifts? Okay. Wow, this is some promotion right here. And he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. Let's see. You promote me, you give me great gifts, and then you make me ruler over the province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Wait a minute, I thought they were the wise men. Apparently, they were, they were not as wise as they thought they were because if they were as wise, they would be serving the God that um, Daniel was serving. I like this. This is, this is so impressive. And then Daniel 2 and 49 says this. It says, also Daniel petitioned, and he sat Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of, of Babylon. So hold up. So you mean to tell me having the right connection gets me to the place and the promotion that God has for me? They stood with Daniel. They, they were willing to, if, hey, look, if we have to go in the fire, so be it. If we have to be put to death, so be it. But the God that I serve is the true and living God. There is none like him on planet Earth. This is how they got their promotion. So when we look at this, we have to understand that as the chosen people, my God, there's things that we do differently from the world. We don't do it the same way. I know what it may look like. I understand what it may sound like. But when the finished product comes out, you have to give glory to the one and only true God that I serve. This is where Daniel and Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were. They understood that. There is elevation and promotion in obedience, would you say? Okay. But hold on. The flip side, 
there's also captivity and demotion with disobedience. See, I got to understand both sides of the coin. God says I'm in a covenant, or God says that they were in a covenant with him. He says, in order for you to experience everything that I have for you, you have to keep your end of the covenant. He says, I'm not going to make it hard. I'm not going to make it impossible. It's going to be something you, you can do, but it's going to require you to be obedient to what I told you to do. In spite of. See, that's where you have to get to a place that I will be obedient to God in spite of. You know, thinking about, you know, how they must have felt during that time to go from the chosen. I mean, you have to really go back and forth on this to go to the chosen to now you're captive. You're, you're, you're experiencing famine. You're being overran by other countries or other nations that's coming in and, and now you're scattering. How do you go from the chosen? I mean, I can just see the glow on that name, the chosen. That's just something amazing. The children of Israel had become, had, had become strangers confused, remember that word, because of their dis disobedience to their God. You'll find that in Jeremiah 14, 8 and 9. The children of Israel had become strangers and confused because of the disobedience to their God. They lost their focus. Woo. They lost their focus. They started off as the chosen. Now confusion set in. And like if you were here Sunday, when the Lord showed me, he says, if you look hard enough, if you look long enough in that word confusion, you will find the word focus embedded in that word. In other words, God will never allow you to get to a place, a place of perceived confusion that you're unable to focus on him. You got to really understand that. I, I had to really let that settle and I had to really get, get a hold of this because I understand that when you're confused, you make bad decisions. Everything looks impressive to you in that confused state. Everybody sounds good like they know what they're talking about. But God says, in that confusion, you will find your ability to focus. And pastor was teaching on being focused. So now I understand as a believer that I can never get to a place that I, I or, or I'm ever in a place that I feel so confused that I can't focus. Because when you get to that place, it says, hold on, let me just look at confusion, find my word focus, pull it out of there, and let me focus again on the one and true living God. That way I'll never get swayed to the left or I'll never sway to the right because I'm always going to walk on that straight and narrow. That's the God that I serve. And guess what? I make no apologies about that. It doesn't matter how mad you get. Say, say what you want about your God. But the day is coming. That God will, will make known to you that there's only one and true living God. So, the saying that we will all go through something, that's a true statement. We will all go through something. But watch this. But that something doesn't have to be because of disobedience. Yeah, I'm going through something that's going to test and elevate my faith. But that something does not have to be because of disobedience. I like when he says, I don't turn to the left or to the right. But I'm walking on that straight. And this is where we have to be as believers. When we look back and we understand the people, we understand the promise, we understand the practice, we understand, what was the last one? The promotion. When we understand that, then when we get to that place where everything seems to be confused, a, a confused place, 
We don't have to be left with our hands wondering what's happening because we know what's happening. And because I'm on that straight and narrow, God got that handled. What's happening? Bow your heads. Sometimes, you know, we look like family in here. Sometimes when, you know, when I examine my life, I look back and there's, there may be some areas in my life where, wow, there's a lot of chaotic things that's going on. And I have to ask myself, what's happening? Is this a test of my faith or is it a lack of obedience? Once I get understanding and revelation of what it is, then I can make the necessary course correction, if you will. If it's because of disobedience, Lord, I'm sorry. I missed it. I made a mistake. And looking back at these examples, I understand obedience is even more, is greater than a sacrifice. God truly wants your obedience. No matter what it may look like, no matter what it may sound like, no matter what anybody else may say, take a few seconds and just tell God, Lord, if there's any area in my life that I'm not obedient in, forgive me. And allow me to get back to that place where I'm in the promised land that's flowing with milk and honey that I can truly call a place of my own. And if you're, on, if you're watching on, um, by internet, for those that will watch later, this appeal is also to you. Take a few seconds and just ask God. You may not have any areas that you are disobedient in, and this just may be a faith challenge. But whatever it is, get clarity. If it tries to confuse you, remember, you can always focus. This is what God wants for his people. And this is why we serve an amazing God. You know, I think about what the Lord means to me. And you can never put a dollar amount on that. But when we think about it, it's just a way of me saying, Lord, thank you. Thank you for answering the question, what's happening? Thank you for being that amazing God. And because of who you are in my life, because of what you have done and what you are doing, I desire to sow this seed into your kingdom because I know that it will reach many, many people. And I understand that this is a covenant between us, a lifetime covenant and beyond. So, Father, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just honor and praise you for each and every person that came out today. Lord, we believe that you will bless them in ways that they have never been blessed, that you will take them to places they, that, that they have never been. And Lord, you will do things in their lives that they have never experienced or seen. And so we honor you and we pray for safe travels in Jesus' mighty, majestic, and matchless name. We give your name, praise, and glory. Amen and amen. You are...